This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a guest and the receptionist at a hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good afternoon. My name is Kelvin Jones. I booked by internet yesterday. Good afternoon, Mr. Jones. Welcome to the Armitage Hotel. Can you spell your first name for me, please? Certainly. K-E-L-V-I-N. Thank you. Do you have your booking number? Or perhaps you printed out your confirmation? Yes, of course. I don't have the printout, but I did remember to note down the number. It's 00 L two three eight one four two zero. Thanks. 00 L two three eight. One four two zero. Oh, I see you've stayed with us before. Yes, on several occasions. And do you still have the same vehicle registration number, HQW five nine one nine? Well, no. This time I have the company car. And what is the registration number? Oh dear, I can't remember. Hang on a minute. Here it is on the key ring. H U V triple three one. Thanks. H U V three 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 one. Now, today is the twenty first of May, and I see you've booked a deluxe room on the fifth floor, room five oh one. Really? I booked a deluxe room. I usually only ever have a standard double room. It's the off season, Mr. Jones, and we've upgraded you. How nice! And what does the deluxe room have? Is it as good as a suite? Almost. It has all the usual, plus a spa bath, fully stocked bar fridge, a king-size bed and a balcony. Is there a view from the balcony? Yes. Is that a view of the bay? Yes, and a glimpse of the blue lagoon as well. Very nice. I hope it'll be warm enough to sit out there. We can't guarantee the weather, Mr. Jones, although we do try to make your stay as comfortable as possible. Thank you. Now that you mention comfort, is it possible to have some extra pillows, please? I have a sore shoulder, you see, and I need to prop it up at night, or I don't get any sleep. Well, you'll find pillows on the bed, of course, and we can send up a couple more later. Well, I'd appreciate that. One more thing. You paid by credit card over the internet. Can I see your credit card, please? Oh, of course. And some photo ID? What would you like? Driver's license? Yes, that's fine. You're staying for five days, is that right? That was the original plan, yes. But the conference has been cut short by two days because the keynote speaker is ill. So I'll be going home on Wednesday. So that's just three nights in all? Afraid so. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Is there anything else I can help you with? Actually, there is. The conference is in a building called Chancery Chambers, but I don't have any idea how to get there. Oh, that's the funny-shaped building on the corner of King and Richard Streets. It's quite straightforward, really, and only a few minutes' walk. Look, I'll show you on this map. Good. A map. I like to follow a map if possible. Right. Well, step out the front entrance of the hotel and you're on Hop Street. Head south on Hop Street towards Gorse Lane and take the second on the left onto Vickers Street West. Go all the way down the hill past the Mexican Cafe on your left, the Rebel Hostel on your right and the big church on the corner of Allen Street. Oh, I think I know the one. It has a huge steeple. Yes, you're right. When you get to the bottom of the hill, you'll have to cross over the main street. What's the name of the main street? Mill Street. Mill Street. Ah, yes. There it is. Cross the main street and continue on to Vickers Street East. There's a big bank next to a bookshop on the corner. Go up the hill towards the entrance to the park. I've heard it's very beautiful. Oh, yes. Well worth a look when you've got some free time. Anyway, don't go in the park. Turn left into Kitchen Street. You'll walk past Bowen's Bistro. Actually, probably the best place to get a good lunch at a reasonable price. After Bowen's, take the second left into Baker's Lane. It's a very short street. Then take the first on your left onto King Street and you should see the Art Deco Chancery Chambers building a bit further along on the corner of Richard Street. Oh, thank you for that. I'm most grateful. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a talk given by a group offering a walking holiday to raise money for charity. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning. I'm very pleased to have been invited along to your club to talk about our charity-sponsored walking holiday for education aid. I'll start by giving you a brief overview of what it entails. First of all, let me explain what we mean by sponsored here. This is where people promise to donate money to the charity. Promise to donate money to the charity if you achieve your goal. In this case, to walk a certain number of miles. Basically, we are organising a ten-day holiday, from the sixth to the sixteenth of November, with eight days actual walking, 
trekking in the Samira Mountains. Let's have a look at some of the details. We require you to raise sponsorship money of at least $3,200, paying $250 of it up front as a deposit, and the rest in stages throughout the year. Out of this, about 35% will go on your expenses, and that leaves 65% guaranteed to go to the charity. Which brings me to the most important part. This trek is being specifically organised to help education in the Samira region. Last year we helped train teachers for the disabled, and this year we're focusing on the pupils. Each of the walkers' sponsorship money will go to individual special needs pupil in one of the mountain schools. In the second part of the talk, I'll be giving you a lot more details. But back to the basic information. Age limits. This is the second time we've run this kind of holiday, and um, on the first we even had an 80-year-old. But we found it was wise to establish limits this time. You have to be at least 18, and the top limit is now 70. Though you need to obtain a health certificate from your doctor if you are over 60 years old. Now, the Samira Mountains are among the highest in the world. But you mustn't be too daunted, we will mainly be trekking in the foothills only. Although there will be spectacular views, even in the foothills. However, you will need to be extremely fit, if you aren't now and you're interested in coming with us. You have plenty of time to get into shape. You'll be sleeping in tents, so you must have quite a bit of equipment with you. But you will be helped by local assistants. Your bedding and so forth will be carried by them. We ask that you only walk with a small rucksack with needs for the day. I don't think I've really said enough about the marvellous area you'll be walking in. Let's have a look at some of the sights you'll be seeing. Apart from these spectacular snow-covered peaks and valleys, there are marvellous historic villages. The area has been famous for centuries for making beautiful carpets, although recently there has been a trend to move into weaving blankets and wood carving. The people are extremely friendly and welcoming. We deliberately keep the party small in size to minimise disruption to people and landscape. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. I hope that there are still some people interested. <laughs> I will be distributing leaflets at the end where you can find out more information. But just for the moment, I'll outline the itinerary, the main high points of the holiday. Obviously, you'll start by flying out to Kishbar, the capital city, on day one. After a couple of days to acclimatise yourself, You'll start the trek on day three, walking through the enormous Katiba forest, which will take the whole of the day. Day four takes us higher up, going through the foothills, past a number of villages, and visiting a school for the disabled in Sohan. Then you have day, that's day five, before going to the spectacular Kumi Temple, with 12th century carvings, set in a small forest by a lake. And that's day six, the highlight for many. We stay near there for day seven, because then comes the hardest day, walking through very mountainous country, but culminating in a swim in the Pate Falls. This is the highest waterfall in the region. Day nine is much easier, with part of the day spent in a village where they make some of the gorgeous red blankets. Then back down to Kishbar and the journey home. So, you can see it's a pretty packed timetable. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two.
Part 3 You will hear two students discussing a science project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Julia. Hi, Bob. Thought about the science project yet? Which one? The presentations are scheduled for next month. The experiments that you and I are working on to demonstrate density, buoyancy and the compression of gases. That'll be complicated. Well, it's not supposed to be. It'll be part of the Making Science Simple series that's being showcased next year, and we have to be ready to demonstrate by the end of next week. Oh, well, simple, you say? Yes, not just the concept, but the materials too. We have to use cheap, readily available common items. Expensive lab equipment is out of the question. I remember something about using recycled or throwaway items if possible. Anything portable that we can bring into the lab. That's right. Well, any ideas for the project? What about the classic Cartesian diver? Is that the same as a Cartesian devil? The invention named after the famous French physicist René Descartes. Yes. A long time ago, superstitious people labelled it that because they couldn't comprehend the scientific principles it demonstrated. They thought it was black magic. How shall we do it? By keeping it as simple, transparent and economical as possible. So, to start with... Open your pencil case and let's have a look. Hmm, you haven't got any... Any what? Paper clips. Oh. There are lots of them in the bottom of my bag. They slip off my papers and collect in the bottom. Look, here's half a dozen. But they're all big metal ones. I want little ones. Small, vinyl-covered, multicoloured ones. Oh, I've got one or two of them too. Great, and if we look around, especially on the floor, we're bound to find a few more. See, here. What else do we need? A small rubber band. Well, I've got one of those in my pocket. No, not that kind. Let's go and ask Tara. Why? Those really small coloured bands for making ponytails are ideal. Hey, Tara? Yes? Have you got any spare rubber bands, like the ones you fasten your hair with? Oh, heaps. A whole packet full. Help yourselves. Terrific. So far, it hasn't cost us anything. What now? Let's go and rummage through the recycling bins beside Joe's Mini Market. What for? We want a two-litre plastic soft drink bottle with lid. Hey, I draw the line at sorting through other people's rubbish, and we're also not likely to find one with a lid. Well, go into the store and buy two litres of soft drink. What flavour? It doesn't matter what kind of drink you get. Just make sure it comes in a clear PET bottle. Where are you going? To the cafeteria behind the resource centre. What for? I'm after some straws. I can get them from the shop when I buy the drink. No, I've seen theirs. They're the waxed paper ones. We need clear plastic, and I know they've got them in the cafeteria. I'll also see if I can get a tall plastic cup from there. Good luck. Meet you back here in five minutes. Maybe longer, because I want to go over to my locker and get a wire coat hanger. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Right. Have we got everything now? I think so. I've got extras of most things, so don't worry if this doesn't work first time. OK. Assembly. Step 1. Take a straw and fold it in two. No, not like that. These plastic ones are quite hard to fold. Try pinching it in the middle. That should make it easier to bend. You may even have to bite it, but not too hard. You want a sharp crease, but you don't want to break it. How's this? Good. Now, second step. Wrap a rubber band several times around the ends to hold them together. Then? Add weight to the diver. So, this straw is the diver? Yes. See how I'm pulling the outside end of a paperclip out a bit? Now, hook the part I bent out into the rubber band that's holding the straw together. No, not that way. It'll fall off. That's right. Turn it over. Now, hook two or three more paper clips on. It's hard to say how many we'll need. The idea is to get the diver to be almost all the way submerged, but not quite. We can put it in this tall cup of water to test it. Hmm. What do you think? Too buoyant? Add another paper clip? I think so. OK, on to the next step. Have you got the empty bottle? Not quite. What do you mean? Well, it's not quite empty. Pour some into this cup for later. Good. Now, fill the bottle with water all the way to the top and we'll gently lower the diver in. Great. Now put the cap back on. And then? The final step is the demonstration of our experiment. You will see that when I squeeze the bottle, the diver sinks. And when I let it go, the diver rises. When you squeeze, the air bubble trapped in the straw compresses and the water rushes in, making it heavier, so it sinks. And the reverse happens when you release the bottle. What's the coat hanger for? Oh, that. If our experiment didn't work the first time and our divers stayed on the bottom, we'd have had to fish it out with a piece of wire or a hook of some kind. It's best to be prepared. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a presentation by a history student about the history of coffee. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. 
In my presentation, I'm going to talk about coffee and its importance both in economic and social terms. We think it was first drunk in the Arab world, but there's hardly any documentary evidence of it before the 1500s. Although, of course, that doesn't mean that people didn't know about it before then. However, there is evidence that coffee was originally gathered from bushes growing wild in Ethiopia, in the northeast of Africa. In the early 16th century, it was being bought by traders, and gradually its use as a drink spread throughout the Middle East. It's also known that in 1522, in the Turkish city of Constantinople, which was the centre of the Ottoman Empire, the court physician approved its use as a medicine. By the mid-1500s, coffee bushes were being cultivated in the Yemen, and for the next hundred years, this region produced most of the coffee drunk in Africa and the Arab world. What's particularly interesting about coffee is its effect on social life. It was rarely drunk at home, but instead people went to coffee houses to drink it. These people, usually men, would meet to drink coffee and chat about issues of the day. But at the time, this chance to share ideas and opinions was seen as something that was potentially dangerous. And in 1623, the ruler of Constantinople demanded the destruction of all the coffee houses in the city, although after his death, many new ones opened and coffee consumption continued. In the 17th century, coffee drinking spread to Europe, and here too, coffee shops became places where ordinary people, nearly always men, could meet to exchange ideas. Because of this, some people said that these places performed a similar function to universities. The opportunity they provided for people to meet together outside their own homes and to discuss the topics of the day had an enormous impact on social life, and many social movements and political developments had their origins in coffeehouse discussions. In the late 1600s, the Yemeni monopoly on coffee production broke down, and coffee production started to spread around the world, helped by European colonisation. Europeans set up coffee plantations in Indonesia and the Caribbean, and production of coffee in the colonies skyrocketed. Different types of coffee were produced in different areas, and it's interesting that the names given to these different types, like mocha or java coffee, were often taken from the port they were shipped to Europe from. But if you look at the labour system in the different colonies, there were some significant differences. In Brazil and the various Caribbean colonies, coffee was grown in huge plantations, and the workers there were almost all slaves. But this wasn't the same in all colonies. For example, in Java, which had been colonised by the Dutch, the peasants grew coffee and passed a proportion of this on to the Dutch, so it was used as a means of taxation. But whatever system was used, under the European powers of the 18th century, coffee production was very closely linked to colonisation. Coffee was grown in ever-increasing quantities to satisfy the growing demand from Europe, and it became nearly as important as sugar production, which was grown under very similar conditions. However, coffee prices were not yet low enough for people to drink it regularly at home, so most coffee consumptions still took place in public coffee houses, and it still remained something of a luxury item. In Britain, however, a new drink was introduced from China and started to become popular, gradually taking over from coffee, although at first it was so expensive that only the upper classes could afford it. This was tea.
and by the late 1700s it was being widely drunk. However, when the USA gained independence from Britain in 1776, they identified this drink with Britain, and coffee remained the preferred drink in the USA, as it still is today. So, by the early 19th century, coffee was already being widely produced and consumed. But during this century, production boomed and coffee prices started to fall. This was partly because new types of transportation had been developed, which were cheaper and more efficient. So now, working people could afford to buy coffee. It wasn't just a drink for the middle classes. And this was at a time when large parts of Europe were starting to work in industries. And sometimes this meant their work didn't stop when it got dark. They might have to continue throughout the night. So the use of coffee as a stimulant became important. It wasn't just a drink people drank in the morning for breakfast. There were also changes in cultivation. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.